This is the ancient and medieval history lesson for Wednesday, 9th of February, 2022. See how I say that with conviction and confidence. 9th of February. And uh, where we were was we were talking about um, John the Baptist, who lives in the wilderness of the Jordan River, east of Jerusalem. There he dresses in animal skins, he eats the honey of wild bees and roots and berries rather than bread and other normal food. He lives alone, and he seems to have the gift or curse of prophecy, which means we should understand the role of a prophet. The role of a prophet is different from the role of a priest, or a minister, or even a regular believer. It's certainly different from the role of a king. In the Old Testament, prophets are there to speak when the institutions that are supposed to bring people closer to God are failing, are misguided or have failed. Prophets are often said to rend their garments in frustration, to rip out their own hair in the ecstasy of explaining what's gone wrong. Prophets do not speak, usually, in quiet and measured terms. Prophets speak with an urgency that says, we are on the wrong path. We are going to be held accountable for our choices. And if we want to return to God's favor and a righteous path, we must change. We must change. Now you and I know how difficult change is in reality. Changing your habits, changing your diet, changing your exercise, changing your study habits, changing your workout routine. It's never easy because what we are doing and what we've gotten used to doing has an inertia of all its own. We're used to it, and we wouldn't have gotten used to it if it wasn't pleasant on some level, if it wasn't, if it didn't suit us on some level. And then we've got a prophet coming along, a voice crying out in the wilderness, is the proverbial saying about John the Baptist in particular, and about prophets in general. Not in the palace, except when he barges in to tell the king. But where nobody's live. Where nobody's do their business. A prophet seems to serve the role of speaking past the institutions of culture directly to individual people. They tend not to be patient men. They tend not to appreciate the niceties of diplomacy or of measured diplomatic language or of a proportional response because their intuition, which they and others believe is connected in some way to God himself, says that we are on the wrong path and we urgently need to recognize and change this. Do you understand how difficult it is to notice things that you don't want to notice? The most difficult thing in the world to accept is a fact that you don't agree with. I could say that again, and I will. Because it's fun. 
The most difficult thing in the world to accept for most people is a fact that you don't agree with. We all have preferences about how the world should work, how we want the world to work, how we think and expect the world will work. And when we get a revelation that doesn't fit that, we have some choices to make. We can accept it as fact, which requires us to reevaluate all previous conclusions, because all previous conclusions were based on a set of information that did not include this dissonant fact. Now, an intellectually honest person will do this, or will at least consider the possibility that the fact might be real, in which case they should still reevaluate everything based on this new material. It's like the conviction of a criminal to a life sentence in prison based on the information that the judge had and that the jury had in the trial. This person was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without parole. And then 20 years, 25 years later, a new fact comes to light that causes the entire verdict to be called into question. What do you do? Well, what a justice system is supposed to do, and usually does, is they will reconsider the case in light of the new facts. And if the new facts are persuasive, what can society do except to say you're free? Sorry about stealing a quarter century of your life. Oops. Now, I'm somebody who tends to believe in fire and brimstone justice for convicted criminals. I believe in the death penalty, more widely applied than it's been in this country since the 1800s. I really, really do. But I'm telling you, there are times when the courts get it wrong. And it's embarrassing. And it's horrifying that some poor devil was deprived of a quarter century of life because of a false sense of facts. Because they were missing a key bit of information. That's not good. And I can tell you, having dealt with politicians, <laughs> the last thing they want to do is admit to being a party to something like that. Because that causes their reputation to come under question. But not everyone is intellectually honest. So what people will do, often, is when they encounter something that doesn't fit their narrative, they play ostrich. And ostrich is the closest thing to a dinosaur we have in the world today. An ostrich has a head about the size of my fist, not including its beak. That means its brain, along with its eyes and its beak, face and its tongue and its breathing and its gullet, all fit into this fist-sized space. When an ostrich is encountered uh, encounter something disturbing. Does anyone know what they classically do? George, they stick their head in the ground. Yep. Oh, don't like this. Whoop! I can't hear, see, smell, can't or see, taste any evil. I must be perfectly okay because here I am with my head in a hole and my posterior sticking up in the air. An ostrich is not, in fact, safe. An ostrich is inviting a predator to take a bite out of ostrich. Mm. Tastes like chicken. Actually, ostrich meat is richer than that. I've had it. Um, <laughs> ostriches think they're safe because they hide from the inconvenient facts. Yeah, exactly. Nom, 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 nom. As a little kid, did you ever do this? Nom, nom, nom. 
I did many times. I kind of did. I would always I just go like, did. I can't hear you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's the intellectual equivalent of a game my uh, twin sisters and I used to play. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to hit you. I'm just going to walk across the room doing this. And if you happen to be in the way, that's a shame. <laughs> Little kids. I'm not touching you. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, God, that's horrible. I don't remember that one. Um, <laughs> the point is, people will often play ostrich. Al Gore, 30 years ago almost, made a movie. Uh, maybe 20, 20, 25 years ago. An inconvenient truth. And in Al Gore's inconvenient truth, he talked about environmental models that included a hockey stick about world temperatures. Temperature, temperature, temperature. And then the last whatever years, whoop, everything's up. Well, that, that, that's, it's been revealed to be a highly dubious model of global temperatures. And he first sold this idea to people in a convention center where he had the technicians slowly turn up the heat. So by the end of the speech on global warming, everyone was sweating because the temperature in the room had gone from the high 60s to the low 90s, slowly. Oh, global warming, it must be real. He did this, okay? This really happened. And in his movie, he talked about how precipitous and irreversible climate damage will be done within the next 10 years. The next 10 years ended at least five years ago. We're still here. The UN has not flooded. Manhattan Island is not underwater. The superstorm has not killed us all yet. 2012, the Mayan apocalypse came and went. Hell, Y2K came and went. You may not remember that as a computer disaster because computer companies decided that we only need the last two numerals in a year. Yeah. So even though our year has four numerals, you know, it's 2022, all of the computers for like 30 years had been just 78, 79, 80, because it was all 1900s. And it never occurred to them that maybe when the century changed, there'd be problems. Oh, yeah, the big, the big so, yeah, we, we spent ridiculous amounts of time and money retooling our computer systems so that when 1999, December 31st, 1159, turned into 12 o'clock, uh, January 1st, 2001, 12 o'clock a.m., that the computers of the world that control finances and nuclear missile systems and things like that, you know, hospital power grids didn't just go, Boop! which, thank God, didn't happen. There were people who thought it did. So, since Al Gore's predictions, which were hyperbolic to anyone with sense, uh, didn't come true, did he step up and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, don't listen to what I said? No, he just changed it. It's like the environmental uh, scientists of the 1970s saying we're going to have an ice age. The glaciers could keep growing in the last 10 years from the 1960s to the 1970s. It indicates we're entering a new ice age period. And then the very same scientists, a little grayer, a little older, a little fatter, 20 years later, said global warming, global warming, global warming. <gasps> so now, in the 2000s, around the time of An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore's movie, you end up with man-made climate change. No, it's not human-made, because men, it's, it's one of the only terms that radical feminists don't mind being male-centric. You know, man-made. How dare you? It's human-made. I'm not a male man. I'm a people person. Um, <laughs> the point... I'm sorry, I can't resist that. The, the, the point is... No, he didn't change. He just changed his timetable. It's like an apocalypse uh, cult leader who says that the world will end on Thursday, February... 9th, uh, 10th, 2022, and for a year or two, everyone gets ginned up, Thursday, 29th, uh, February 9th, 2022, <gasps> and then it's it's Friday the 10th, and or Friday the 11th, and it's all over. Well, I, I was wrong. It, it isn't February 10th, 2022. 
It's some other date. Oh. I could have made one up, but by this point, some people would see. So, what does this have to do with prophets? Human beings don't like recognizing when they're wrong. Human beings don't like admitting that they're wrong. Human beings genuinely don't, despite the title of the movie, like to recognize inconvenient truths. So we hide, we play ostrich, we delude ourselves. We say that a man who became Prime Minister of Canada because his daddy was Prime Minister of Canada, who's never worked a day in his life, and who wore blackface in college to insult African Canadians and Indian, Asian Indian Canadians. Virtue signals about how other people are racist, sexist, homophobes, Islamophobes, and the rest, when a bunch of genuine working class people that he's supposed to work for goes to the capital city to protest mandates. To me, that seems unusual. It seems delusion. But I'm not the Prime Minister of Canada, so what do I know? The point of a prophet is to shake people up. The point of a prophet is to say to comfortable, satisfied people who have a care in the world, it's not so secure as you think. You are not nearly as righteous as you think. You are not nearly as saved as you think. You're not even nearly as good as you think. You tell yourselves pretty fantasies. You, you, you whisper little lies to make you feel better about life, the universe, and everything, and your place in it. Open your eyes. Rip off the bandage. Open the scab. Clean out the festering old wound. Change your life. That's the job of a prophet. Which is, of course, why most prophets are madmen. Because you'd have to be crazy to do that. You don't want to get in the path of a stampeding herd of cows or bulls. Or cows and bulls. You don't want to get into their path. Because they will crush you without even noticing. You don't want to get into the way of a mob. Because they will, again, they'll run right over you without even thinking. Because in a mob, human beings have given up their own individuality for a while, and they've joined into the frenzy of the collective delusion that is the mob. A prophet has to be willing to say to the most powerful people in his community, you're not, <laughs> you're not good. And he has to be willing to say to the mob, you're wrong. And he has to be willing to live with the consequences or die as a result. So prophets have a pretty unique role in the history of monotheism. And John the Baptist seems to be in this role. But there's one other thing that Christians believe that is specific to John. They believe, we believe, Christians believe, Christians like me, that John's appearance was to prepare the world for Jesus' arrival, for his ministry. That John's entire mystery, uh, ministry was about getting people ready to hear the words of Christ. Now, John and Jesus, early on, competed. Jesus and John didn't speak the same way. John was about fire and brimstone and damnation and repenting. He's the kind of preacher that... My wife once saw a Billy Graham. He was a, the first real televangelist in our culture. And one of her older relatives wanted to see this, so she, she got uh, Tina to view it when Tina was a little girl. And his descriptions of hellfire and damnation were so vivid that she for years didn't have anything to do with church of any kind because she thought that's what religion was. Jesus, while he had had his moments of anger, for the most part preached love. 
There are differences. But despite the fact that at first John's followers competed with Jesus' followers, after a while, John the Baptist's ministry was folded into the Christian tradition. And John was laying the groundwork for Jesus. That's what Christians believe. Here's how John ends. Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee, son of uh, Herod the Great. Herod Antipas, king of the Jews in the north, marries his sister, Herodian, or Herodias. That's nasty. Yep. But it's in the tradition of uh, it's in the tradition of Herod the Great. Keeping the bloodline. Yeah. Uh, in any event, John the Baptist publicly says, "This is incest. This is wrong. You should stop it now, for the sake of your souls and for the sake of your people." Now, Herod did not want to tangle with a holy man. Herod Antipas was enough of a politician to understand that lots of people inconvenienced themselves mightily to leave the cities and towns, to travel to the Jordan River, to hear John's preaching, and to get baptized by him. There is nothing to be gained from arguing with a man like that. Leave him to his ravings. Let his people flash in the pan about me, he'll be on to another subject next week. So Antipas, Herod Antipas, didn't want to respond to this. But Herodias was unhappy because she felt that this guy had shown such open disrespect. He was supposed to be trembling in his boots, but instead he was insulting the royal family for doing what they were doing? How dare you? How dare you? How dare you call royal family on issues that they're actually doing? You're not supposed to notice things like that. You're supposed to shut up, keep your head down, and bow, and, and scrape, and, and do all the genuflecting stuff. So she doesn't let it go. And she's at Antipas. God did you something about John? God did you something about John? God did you something about John? And Antipas says, what? Make him a martyr? Make him an even greater voice? Give the people an excuse to actually doubt my rule because I'm so thin-skinned that I wonder what some honey-eating wild man at the river says about me? I'm not doing it. God did you something about John? God did you something about John? Okay. Now they have a daughter. Salome. I've got to say, my mind is a little cloudy this morning. The incest may not be close brother and sister. It's certainly within first cousin. Okay. So Herodias and John, Herod Antipas are either brother and sister or they're first cousins. It's still nasty. And it's still nasty. But I had a staff meeting this morning, so I wasn't able to do last minute touch and freeze. It's no excuse. In any case, they was close family members. And Salome is a close family member, daughter, niece of Antipas and Herodias. And Salome is having her coming out party. She's, uh, she's become a woman. She's in her early to mid teens. And she, at her coming out party, is going to dance for the court of Herod Antipas. And when I say dance, I'm not talking ballet. I'm not talking, you know, classy stuff. I'm not talking belly dancing either. But it is going to be a highly sensual dance. And she does this dance in front of her close relatives, parents, aunts, uncles, whatever. And Antipas is so moved by her performance that he says something no king should ever say. He says to his daughter niece, Salome, whatever you want, just ask of it, and I'll give it to you. He's a king. 
There's a lot he can do. And there's a lot that she might ask. That's like giving somebody a blank check to your one and only checking account. That's like giving somebody your credit card number and all your secret information. That's like giving a Nigerian prince access to your bank account so he can ship money into the country. You don't, do like, that. don't do that. No, I don't. Know. Stupid me. Anyway, Matumba's going to have to find another way. The, the point is, <laughs> he says this, she, she, Salome is thrilled. But Salome has been prepped by her mom, Herodias. I do know that. And Herodias says, uh, she nods at Salome, and Salome says, okay, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. <laughs> oh, Herod Antipas is not pleased. He, realize he's, he realizes he's been played by the women in his life. And he has publicly said in front of his court, anything you want, kitten. And she says the one thing he didn't want to do. Mm. Now, Antipas had arrested John, had put him in jail to try to get Herodias to shut the heck up. But he wasn't going to, he was going to release him. But now Herod has a choice. Herod Antipas can go back on his word, which will, he thinks, make him lose fate in front face in front of his courtiers. Oh, I, I, I'm a king, and if I can't keep my word, then what am I? I'm going to have to keep my word. But if I keep my word, my kingdom will be at risk because a lot of people will be so angry with me, they might rise up. So we could be talking about the death of thousands. But if I break my word, then I look weak, and I don't want to look weak. Long story short, the next night, there's a feast. And at the feast, a special platter is brought to Salome, and they open it up. And it's like Pompey. Remember Pompey goes to Egypt, gets his head chopped off? Well, um, Salome gets her wish. There's John the he Baptist's severed head on a platter. Herodias is happy. Herod Antipas has given in. The prophet is dead. Oh, his followers are not happy. And one of the benefits that comes to Jesus because of this is that it's as if John the Baptist passes the torch. I'll tell you how that happens in just a moment. But John the Baptist's ministry ends around the time Jesus is, really takes off. So, before John the Baptist is arrest, arrested by Antipas, by, uh, what's the lesson here? Well, one lesson is don't ever, if you're a king or a queen, uh, or if you ever have total power, don't ever tell anyone anything you want. Because anything could be anything, including things that are truly stupid and bad. Before Herod Antipas arrests John the Baptist, he's at the river doing his thing. And a man shows up. Jesus of Nazareth. Joshua of our Joseph. Yeshua. He has decided to step out from obscurity and to begin his ministry. And the first thing he does is he goes to John the Baptist. And he hears John the Baptist speak, and he gets in line. And John the Baptist is doing his full adult immersion baptism thing. And the story goes, he looks up, and he stops. Now, usually he's in an ecstasy of frenzy or a frenzy of ecstasy, just talking and speaking intuitively and speaking prophetically and blah, 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 blah. And he stops and he looks at Jesus and everything gets quiet. And John says, shouldn't you be baptizing me? Jesus kneels down and says, please. So John brings Jesus onto the water pulls him up again, and suppose, supposedly from the heavens a voice comes, this is my son, 
my only begotten Son, with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus leaves John. That's their encounter. John baptizes Jesus, and it is said that John recognizes Jesus as the one he's been waiting for. John has never said, I am the answer. John said repeatedly, there is one who is coming, who I am not worthy to kiss the hem of his garment. There is one who is coming, who is far more important than me. And in that story, in that encounter, the baton is passed from John to Jesus. And very soon after that, John is arrested and held for a while. Jesus begins his ministry, followers of John are angry, and then Salome does her dance, and, and John is gone. Now, after Jesus is baptized, he goes into the wilderness. This is something holy men do, prophets and otherwise. John lives in the wilderness for this reason. Moses first really encounters God when he is traveling away from Egypt after he's been exiled. He's going crossing Sinai. Sinai is a terrible wilderness. Uh, not enough water, no food. you got to keep walking or you die. Monotheists believe in a God that has presented itself, uh, himself again and again in the desert. It's a desert God. It's a god of people wandering in the wilds without enough water. Days are too hot, nights are too cold. Extremes. Walking on sand, rock, dust. Jesus has been, has, has accepted God's call, has stepped out from obscurity, has been recognized by John the Baptist, but he's got something else to do before he goes out and starts preaching. He goes into the wilderness. He retreats away from people. And it's proverbially for a 40-day period. And whenever the Bible says 40 days, remember, the Noachian flood is 40 days and 40 nights. Lots of things. 40 days is just a bunch of time. It's not an exact. It's, it's, it's more than a month. It's less than a year. It's less than half a year, probably. It's just it's a big chunk of time. So Jesus goes into the wilderness away from everyone else. And he sits down to fast, that means not eat, and meditate. So something holy men do. Why would people fast? Well, people who do this sort of thing says that it helps clean out your system. But not only does it help clean out your system, it helps your mind to remember that it's in control of the body. Normally, a person's instincts are so strong, it's very difficult for the mind to resist. But if you make a habit of asceticism, of living very, very frugally, very, very simply, if you include meditation where you have to stay in a rigid posture, and fasting, where you don't eat. Your body wants to eat. Your body needs to eat. Your body suffers when you don't eat. But if your mind says no, you make it happen. That's an amazing kind of willpower that people who aspire to learn about holiness and sacredness often do. So Jesus goes into the wilderness to prepare himself for what's to come. He sits down in the desert and prays and fasts. And he gets hungrier, and physically weaker, and hungrier, and physically weaker. And then he begins to hear the voice of the adversary. The word Satan means adversary. He hears, hears the worse words of Diabolos. Diabolos, a Greek word for the devil, means confusion through and through. He hears the voice of the serpent, of the tempter, the same voice that whispered to Eve, eat the fruit. 
what could possibly go wrong? You want to be like God. And this voice is tempting Jesus. Wouldn't it be nice if you, the Son of God, don't have to suffer like this? You're not a normal person. You could say a word and these rocks around you would become loaves of bread. And when you've been starving for a week or two, a loaf of bread is just mouthwateringly tempting. Jesus responds, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. First temptation towards physical satiation has been passed. Second temptation, the adversary brings Jesus to a high place. He says, you're the son of God. Jump off this cliff. And the angels wouldn't prevent, would prevent you from even bruising your heel. You could jump and your special nature would make you fly. Wouldn't that be thrilling? And you would know your power. Jump. And Jesus' response is, you shall not put your Lord to the test. What he means by that, as I understand it, is you don't say to God, prove yourself. You don't say to God, show me your power, show me your magic. You don't do something like jump off a cliff when you're in human form and expect God to magic you from being hurt. What you're doing when you, if you were to do that, is you are demanding that God do what you say. And the thing about God, the thing you really need to understand is that he's the boss of you, if you're a believer. You're not the boss of him. Jesus jumping would command God to save him. That isn't the whole, that isn't the relationship. This third temptation is the greatest of all. And I'm probably going to screw up the lesson. So if any of you know it better than I do, I will ask for your help. The adversary brings Jesus to the tallest mountain where he can see all the nations of the world. This is metaphoric. But... You can imagine. And the adversary says, join me, son of God. And all of these powers and principalities, and those words, powers and principalities, doesn't just refer to human rulers. It refers to demons, devils, fallen angels. And all of the powers and principalities will bow before you. Simply bow to me and the world will bow to you. That's a hell of a thing for the devil to say to the Son of God. He's tempting. Jesus is human. He's human form. He's hungry. He's tired. He's already been tempted with food and rejected it. He's already been tempted with uh, magic. and He's re rejected it. Now he's being tempted with power. Now, do any of you know the precise wording or the general wording of the response to this third temptation? If you don't, I will I will actually find it and, and read it. But, yeah? Doesn't he just say, like, God, Satan? He does say, get thee behind me, Satan, or be God, Satan. There is that at the end. I think he says something else, though, that explains why he's not going to accept the devil's offer. One of the things that comes to my mind is that the devil's not going to offer God anything worthwhile. All the devil can do is offer to God evil people who've already sold their souls for power, for wealth. So would Jesus 
in the wilderness. Damn, that's the smart way. So we live in the 21st century. Uh, would, would Jesus really want people that the devil could offer? Okay, so what I'm looking up is... Uh, okay, RSB Bible. Third temptation. Jesus. Matthew 4.11. Okay, and Luke 4, 1 through 13. Let's see. Okay, Matthew 4.11. Matthew chapter 4, verse 11. I know, a good teacher would have had all this ready. Bad teacher. Okay. So this is from the Gospel of Matthew, from the Revised Standard Version of the Holy Bible, Standard Protestant Bible. Then the devil left him, and behold, angel... Oh, that's right afterwards. <laughs> These pages are so thin. Okay. Okay. Uh, so... Let's see. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And the devil said to Jesus, all these I will give if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, he said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So what the devil was demanding, I'm so impressed, what the devil was demanding was something uh, that Jesus shouldn't give to anyone but God. And at that point, the devil disperses and Jesus' temptations are over and he's ready to go on his ministry. What is this all about? Aside from just a good pattern for anyone who's about to do important work getting comfortable inside their own skin by trying to get rid of all the distractions and think about what you're really about. Okay. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. What does that mean? Well, it could mean that he is what the Jews expected, which is Superman Gandalf, Dumbledore. A magic man who uses powers and miracles to impress people. Again and again, people come to Jesus and say, hey, you're a miracle man. Do me a miracle. Come on, just do me a miracle. Do me a single miracle, and I'll believe. And Jesus never does. Now, either he never does because he's self-delusional and crazy, and the people are challenging the madman to show his magic, and he, he has no magic because he's insane. I, I don't believe that, but it has, it has been said. Or, and this is what I do believe, what would showing somebody like that prove anyway? You have a nasty skeptic who is power hungry, and they don't see things in the proportion of God, they see things in terms of the world. So, you make flames appear in the midair. You make a waterfall come out of nowhere and flow into nowhere. You make them wet by having their hands or sticking their head into the waterfall, and then it's gone. You turn staffs into snakes. You uh, make hail fall from the sky and then burn. I mean, you could do magic. It's been done. Moses did magic in front of the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh didn't go, ooh, you're dealing with God. The Pharaoh went, really? Even if a person believed in the kind of miracle that you said, come on, show me your magic, show me your magic, show me your magic. Like that moment in Return of the Jedi, where Luke says to C-3PO, tell the Ewoks that you will be angry with them, an angry golden god, if they, if they, if they eat us. And 3PO says, what am I going to tell them? 
And Luke says, just do it. And C-3PO pisses. C-3PO, the, the golden robot, says, you will make me angry if you eat my friends. And Luke levitates him. And then they all go, ooh, 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 ooh. I remember the sound. Jesus never does that. In fact, what these temptations are about is what Jesus decides he's going to do as part of his ministry and what he's not going to do. Jesus is not going to use his power to satisfy himself. He's not going to use his power to feed himself, to enrich himself, to empower himself. He's not going to use the magic to tell everyone, look at me, I'm so great. Jesus' purpose is to show people what God the Father is like. So when Jesus uses miracles or what the Gospel of John calls signs, these are miraculous events, whether it's making wine or raising Lazarus from the dead or making loaves and fishes for the multitudes or healing the sick. But these miracles and signs are not just about, I'm powerful, you should worship me. They are about lessons about the nature of God. And miracles are to be used in a certain way, never selfishly, never selfishly. So these temptations serve a very important purpose. They prepare Jesus for the path. And if you want to understand, again, we studied Akhenaten, the new kingdom pharaoh, who tried through his power as the king of Egypt to make Egypt worship a new one god, the god of the sun, the Aten. Jesus has the opposite approach to this. The pharaoh was the most important pair person in Egypt. Jesus was, at best a wandering sort of prophet guy. The Pharaoh had thousands of men willing to kill to enforce his will. Jesus had a dozen followers or so that traveled with him who were common as dirt, fishermen, prostitutes, tax collectors, failed people here and there, deluded people looking for a purpose in life. The Pharaoh lived in a palace. Jesus, once he started his ministry, never lived anywhere. He traveled. The Pharaoh commanded. Jesus taught. Jesus asked. Had the Pharaoh been successful, the people of Egypt would have become monotheists by royal decree. In other words, the government would have told them, believe this. And the people of Egypt would have gone along with it because otherwise they'd go to jail. They would have responded to a, an appeal of the powerful. Do what you're told. The person who you believed was a god by the old religion is telling you the old religion is hokum. He's telling you now, there's a new, truer religion. And if you're a patriot, if you're a good Egyptian, you'll go along with it. That's not the way Jesus works. I can't think of a single time where Jesus tells someone to believe. Jesus appeals to people. Jesus does miracles and healing and teaching for people. But people always have the choice to say yes or no. And Jesus doesn't promise happy, easy times. There's a moment where a young, wealthy son, the heir to a great fortune, comes to Jesus after hearing him speak and says, how I, I, I'm ready to, I want to be, a fo I want to be following you. You, you, wow. Just wow. Let me follow you. Yeah. He was like, I will give up um, like 
I really want to follow you. I've been donating to the charities. I've been praying. I've been doing all this good stuff. Let me follow you. Mm -hmm. and, and what does Jesus say? Do you recall? Yeah, he's like, give up everything, like everything, your riches, your fortune, your own name, and follow me, and be dedicated to God, and all that. And the guy's like, oh, I don't want to do that. Right. And that's where Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. The point isn't that rich people are bad and poor people are good. The point is that when Jesus says, follow me, he's not offering anything other than a cross. He actually says to somebody, take up a cross and follow me. Now, remember what a crucifixion is in Roman times. It hasn't yet become a sign of glorious religious faith. Oh, so the I have a needle thing, I have a footnote in my Bible, and uh, it's basically saying, it's talking about, like, uh, there's like, uh, entryway that yeah. it's called the eye of the needle and it's not impossible yeah it's just really difficult it's just like incredibly hard imagine that you've got an opening through a city wall the city wall is there to protect your city so you've got gates but you've got this really narrow passage a human being can't walk through it he's got to crawl through it now can a camel get through that space yeah it's called the eye of a needle because it's so small but the camel really has to want to and it, it, it requires, uh, to get a camel to do anything is not easy. Camels are stubborn, and they like spitting at you. So it, it's no, it's not impossible. It's not like fitting a man through a sewing needle's eye. It's, you're that's, that's as I understand. Absolutely right. The point is, the Pharaoh could offer promotions, riches, power. Only do what he says about religion. And it failed. It completely failed. Jesus has nothing to offer, but, I mean, Churchill, uh, in World War II, tells the English people, I have nothing to offer you but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. In other words, I'm offering you war. War against the Nazis. Jesus offers them. But he becomes the founder of a great religion. Anyway, thank you for your attention. We'll talk more. Adios.